Without camp and without retreats like this, I would not be in ministry. So I am so touched that you all would have me tonight here on your last evening. And Matthew, thank you for the invitation. So glad to be here. A man was on his way down to Jericho, traveling a perilous road that was called Bloody Pass. Unarmed, he rounded a blind corner where bandits leapt from the shadows in ambush. They stripped him bare, they assaulted his flesh, they chunked his body on the broken line, and then they disappeared into the surrounding desert. A few minutes later, a priest and his associate, religious leaders on their way to church, heard the pleas and saw the man begging for rescue. But they glanced at their watch and decided, it's an inconvenient time. Vestments need to be ironed, lambs need to be sacrificed, candles need to be lit, worship can never start late. After the clergyman passed on by, a foreigner approached. Alerted to the emergency, the Samaritan dropped to his knees beside the bleeding man. He wrapped gauze around the open wounds. He sterilized the gashes with wine. He applied ointment to the lacerated skin. He hoisted the man up onto his donkey. He led the animal into town. He prepaid for two months of lodging. He nursed the patient's every infirmity, and he left the innkeeper with a blank check for anything else. While the Good Samaritan did not stick around for the award ceremony, his selfless discipleship has captivated listeners then and now, making tonight's text Jesus' most popular. But with 2,000 years of overexposure, diminishing the story to a fable about neighborhood charity, the parable has lost its conviction. One way to reclaim it is by asking this question. According to the Good Samaritan, what does love require? According to the Good Samaritan, what does love require? There's a few folks here that have been to Haywood Street where I get to be the pastor, and we preach by committee. That means you all are going to get a chance to answer this exact question. So we're going to hear the text read from Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, and then I will ask you again this question. What does love require? But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers, who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side of the road. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw the man, he passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who held and fell into the hands of robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Thank you so much. All right, when a retreat, according to the Good Samaritan, what does love require? What do you think? Anybody got some answers to that? Yes, sir. Well, at least personally, I don't believe love requires any talent, strength, mm. wit, smartness, anything like that. It only requires a willingness to help. That's a beautiful answer. Love doesn't require any talent, just rather a willingness to help. It's important to know that Samaritans were thought of as literally less than people. They were considered half-breeds. They did not worship in the same way that was considered right. They were from over there. Literally, when you look in the Gospels, you'll notice that Jesus is always 
on a boat crossing over to the other side. That's a way for the gospel writer to say, uh, Jesus is going to be with the other people, the folks, the untouchables. Samaritans weren't with those folks. They were considered, again, dismissible in every way. And here is a story where Jesus is holding up this person who's completely ostracized from the religious community and saying, ah, he can do something we can all learn from. That's right. You do not have to have a resume. You do not have to have a degree. You do not have to go to seminary to practice your faith. You have, simply have to be willing. Thank you so much. Yeah, what do you think? Putting others' um, needs before yours. Yeah, putting others' needs before yours. This is such a text about selflessness. A detail that's really helpful to know is if you ever have travel to the Holy Land, you'll notice that Jerusalem is at 3,000 feet above sea level. Jericho is at 1,000 feet below sea level. There's one road. It's an ancient road. And if you travel it, you will notice there are endless switchbacks. It's a dangerous road. As I said, it's called Bloody Pass. For the Samaritan to get off of his animal was to subject himself to the same danger that the man in the ditch is. The Samaritan does a remarkable thing. He says, I care enough about responding that I will jeopardize my own well-being. It's a beautiful act of selflessness, risking bodily harm to make sure somebody else's life is saved. Anybody else? What does love require? This side of the room has done great. Anybody over here? Sacrifice. Come on, Micah. Do you have something? <laughs> yeah, sacrifice, Matt. That's a great answer. Remember, the Samaritan is headed somewhere else. This is not on his schedule. He not only risks his time, he risks his money, he risks his safety, but he risks his literally entire livelihood for this very moment. There's a reason why many people say the ultimate good Samaritan is not this actual person, but rather Jesus. Flip to the end of the gospel and you will notice Jesus does all of these things as well. Everything Jesus has to give, including his very life, is willing to offer for us. The good Samaritan is very much Jesus. Sacrifice, yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Respect? Yeah, can you tell me a little bit more? Yeah, you want to respect the others around you. What's interesting to me is the Samaritan has absolutely no reason to respect the man who was hurt. In fact, there's an awful lot of possibility that they were rivals of some sort. And yet, because he saw the humanity in him, he was willing to cross over to the other side and help. I am convinced one of the most dangerous things happening in the United States right now is something called tribalism. It's this idea that I am only going to congregate with my own kind because someone else is the radical other. The Samaritan could have done that. He could have said, you know what, I'm only going to help other Samaritans. But out of respect for the, the God inside this other man, he is willing to help in such a beautiful, remarkable way that here we are 2,000 years later and we're still talking about it. Thank you for that. After countless racially motivated atrocities in South Africa, Nelson Mandela appointed Archbishop Desmond Tutu to head what was called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It was a government panel tasked with blunting revenge. During these gatherings, there was one rule that was non-negotiable. If a white police officer confessed and faced his accuser, then amnesty, not criminal punishment, was possible. At one of the hearings, Officer Vandebroek stood up and admitted to ravaging a family. He had taken the life of a father and a son. The black wife and mother was sitting nearby and she steadied herself. The commission, uncertain how to exercise justice in this case, turned to her and said, what is your opinion? She answered, I want three things. 
First, I want to be taken to the place where my husband's body was born, burned so that I can collect the ashes and then give his remains a proper funeral. Second, I want Mr. Vandebroek to become my son. I want him to come visit me twice a month in the ghetto and spend a whole day with me so that I can pour out on him whatever love I have left. Third, and finally, I want Mr. Vandebroek to know that I forgive him because Jesus forgives all of us. She motioned for help, and one of the assistants led her across the courtroom where she embraced her new child. Mr. Vandebroek, in response, fainted. For the audience who was there, these witnesses who had been the recipients of injustice themselves, they lifted their voices and began to sing Amazing Grace among themselves. In Cape Town, Officer Vandebroek was the hated adversary. In Seoul, South Korea, it's the maniacal dictator Kim Jong-un. In Oklahoma City, it's the terrorist Timothy McVeigh. In Cherokee, it's President Andrew Jackson. And in Shechem, the religious capital of ancient Samaria, it was the Jew. Jews believed that the kingdom of God did not include Samaritans because they denied rebuilding Solomon's temple, deviated from Torah, colluded with Syria, and they rejected Jerusalem as the holy city. Samaritans mocked for being on the wrong side of redemption history held Jews in contempt. The detail that often eludes modern readers is something that the first hearers of Jesus' parable would have understood immediately about the man on bloody pass in the parable. The good Samaritan was not responding to the neighbor next door, but rather to the rival who wished he weren't alive. What makes the Samaritan so good is that love requires moving towards mercifully, attending to and initiating relationship with the person that we consider our most sworn enemy. Preaching on this very same text, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said this, we cannot afford the luxury of passing by on the other side. Such folly used to be called moral failure, but today it is considered universal suicide. We, however, cannot long to survive spiritually separated in a world that is geographically together. I cannot cross to the other side and avoid the man in the ditch on life's Jericho Road because he is a part of me and I am a part of him. His anguish diminishes me. His salvation enlarges me. On this MLK weekend, the rallying cry is likely going to be organized around individual civil rights, around the personal liberties of selfhood. I would like to argue, however, that there's something far more significant than that. While often omitted, the late pastor of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church believed that liberation is always communal, that no one, no one, not oppressed, nor oppressed, oppressed or can ever be saved by themselves. For those of us here tonight who are looking not just to be free, an act a citizen does by themselves, but rather to be free in Christ. Our collective freedom is bound up in the foe who denies our sacred worth, who slanders our reputation, who insults our character, who denies our dignity, who likely will never return the favor. Although the hardest thing to do is almost always the Christian thing to do, Hear the news that we are called to most. Go and do likewise and cross over. Amen.